Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 5, and going on to chapter 11, verse 32. Obviously, we're not going to be reading it because it's too much, but I'm hoping that this session will really help you when you come to read Deuteronomy yourself, when you read from this, you have a framework in which to kind of understand it and assess it and apply it to your lives. And so what we're looking at in this section of Deuteronomy is we've said Deuteronomy is very much like the covenants that the Hittites made when they were subsuming an inferior power under them, a, a little nation, and saying, we will protect you, but you better adhere to us. And if you don't want this covenant, we'll just take you out. That's the way the Hittites were. But the Lord is making this covenant in a different way. He's saying, you're going to be my special treasured possession. But the format of the book of Deuteronomy, the structure, very much fits in with that kind of covenant. And in chapter 5, verse 1, to chapter 11, verse 32, you could kind of call this general stipulations of the covenant. That means God's giving an overview of what he requires from his people Israel. He'll get into the specifics from chapter 12 onwards. But chapter 5 to chapter 11 is a general overview of what God accept, expects from his people. And guess what it revolves around? 100%. The law. The law of God. And so, chapter 5 looks, we're going to look at this, all of these 11 chapters in five sections. Firstly, chapter 5 is the crux of the covenant. It's the real center of the covenant, and it is the Ten Commandments. You'll find that those Ten Commandments, and they're in chapter 5, verses 5 onwards, they start with the phrase, Oh, in verse 6, sorry. I am Yahweh your God. And that's a really interesting and important point to make. Because when you teach the Ten Commandments to your kids, do you teach them as commandments to obey? Or do you start with the character of God? Do you start with God? You know, often when we teach the Ten Commandments, we start with, you shall have no other gods before me. But the Ten Commandments don't start with, you shall have no other God before me. They start with, I am Jehovah, Yahweh, your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The law of God, as he gave it to Israel, is prefaced on grace. His call for them to obey was not so that they would become, after they've obeyed God's people, but it's prefaced on the fact that I saved you, I delivered you, and I brought you out from Egypt. Now obey my commandments. The Ten Commandments without the God of the Ten Commandments does not avail. There's a film, I, I think they got it on YouTube for free to watch. It's called Time Changer. It's well worth watching. And there's an argument in this film where they say, Bringing God into it is a bit old-fashioned. This is the 1800s we're talking about. Bringing God in is old-fashioned. People don't want to hear God. We should promote God's morals. Let's promote you shall not steal and you shall not commit adultery. Let's, let's try and make society a better place. And one of the professors in this university where they were discussing it said, you want to know where that is going to lead you. I will show you, he shows the professor who wrote this manuscript, take God out of morality, just promote godly morals. And in this film, he builds a time machine, which takes that guy into the 20th century. And in the 20th century, he goes up to this kid who's stealing, and he says, you shouldn't steal, and the kid says, who says? That's what you get when you take God out of morality, you end up with moral relativism. Now you can say, no, we, we, we all have the same moral compass, but that tribe in Indonesia, I don't know if they still are there, but they used to be, cannibals, for them, cannibalism is, was moral at least. 
might be for some people still today. It's moral to take someone from another tribe and, and kill them and eat them. Who says? We say God says. God is at the center of the Ten Commandments. You cannot take him out. So that's the first statement. The second is, you could summarize what God is calling them to do by the, the first word that Moses says in verse 1. Hear. Hear, and then you say here, at the end of that verse it says, that you may learn them and be careful to do them. And that word here is, I've said it before, shema, which means in this context, listen up and do it. If you, I mean, I've, I've seen die with certain kids and, you know, when she's having to look after them and the kid's just not behaving, she will go down to the eye level of that kid and she will say, look at me, look at me, because she's basically saying, you better pay attention and I need your attention so that you can hear because if you can hear, then you must do. But if you're not listening, you're not going to do. So it starts with hearing. Hearing, then learning, and then doing. Hearing without doing doesn't avail. James writes about this in James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verses 14 to 19. Do you, don't you know... He, faith without works is dead. He actually says at the end of that, I think it's verse 19, he says, you believe that God is one? Well done. Congratulations. But guess what? The demons, they also believe that God is one and they shudder. You see, believing is different to Christian believing. You can be a believer. I believe God exists. I believe he's there, and I believe, well, the Bible's a sacred book. That's very different to personally putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, in one sense, you can say the believers are demons. Oh, sorry, the demons are believers. They believe God is there. They know he's there. But they're not believers in the Christian sense of the word, believers. There's a difference. God is calling to himself a people they not only believe that he exists, but they live their lives in the light of that truth. That they know that they have sinned and that they are inadequate in themselves and they know they need the Lord. That's what the Lord is calling for. Even in Deuteronomy, he's calling Israel to know they can't do it without him. They need a change of heart, as we'll see just now. And when you look at these Ten Commandments, that they are to not only here, but to do as well, you'll find that these Ten Commandments, they express the heart of the law, and they are the embodiment of what comes after. So really, Scripture can be summarized in two commandments. The whole of the law can be summarized in two commandments. The first four commandments of the ten, some people would say the first five, are duty to God. And the last six, or some people would say the last five, is duty to man. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the heart of it. That's what the Ten Commandments are about. Now, why do some people say the first five? Because the fifth commandment is, and the parents love this one, honor your father and mother. <laughs> you have to keep telling your kids that, right? Honor your father and mother. Why would you put that in duty to God? Because... If you cannot respect and honor the parent, your father on earth, your mother on earth that you can see, how are you going to respect the father in heaven that you cannot see? And so authority, the first part of authority is not the prime minister or the president, it's not the police. The first place of authority is in the home. Your kids learn to respect authority through their relationship with you. And if you think about it, if you raise your kids as godly examples, you set your kids up for the future when the Lord grabs their heart and they get saved, you set them up to connect with God. Because certain people, if they have an abusive father, and that father doesn't show any love for them, 
doesn't care for them, just abuses them. When they get saved, they have to grapple with the idea that God is Father. How do I, how can I trust God as Father when fathers are abusive? You know, that's the frame of reference. Someone who grows up with a godly father, a loving father, doesn't struggle as much or doesn't struggle to connect with the idea that God is Father. And so the home, you you can never underestimate the role that those parents play in their example and their love and their teaching to their children. That you set them up for the future to connect with God himself. So the first five commandments, if you want to say the first five of duty to God, you have every right to say that. But notice, duty to God and duty to man, what comes first? Duty to God comes first. And we run into problems when we allow duty to man to usurp our duty to God. We run into huge problems. It's very loving, this is, I'm putting this out there, it's very loving, it feels loving to go to, you know, your gay friend's wedding and to be witness there, to support them. It feels very loving, and it be considered as loving. There's one problem. It's not loving to God. That you are bearing witness to something that God says, I do not accept this. Now, that doesn't mean you should not have gay friends. It shouldn't mean that you don't hang out with gay people. Paul actually says that in 1 Corinthians. He says, don't you know that the, uh, he says, don't you know that um, the unrighteous, you know, if you've got a so-called brother who is a fornicator and adulterer, he says, you're not even to eat with such a one. But he says, I'm not talking about the people of the world, because then you would have to go out of the world. He's, the Bible says we're to eat with unbelievers. Whether it's gay, straight, whether it's idolater, whether it's a drunkard, We rub shoulders in the world with people. And so we need to reach people. We shouldn't have the superior mentality, you're a thief, so I'll have nothing to do with you. We need to reach them with the gospel. But there's something different. When you go to a gay wedding, you are being witness to those vows. You are supporting the marriage. So God calls us to place love for him first, which to the world seems like hatred. But isn't that what the Lord says in Luke chapter 14? Luke 14 and verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, hate's a very strong word, but we must understand this. Scripture says, honor your father and mother. But here he says, hate your father and mother. How do you reconcile that? Because hate here is a relative term. Your love for God should make your love for your parents seem as hate in comparison. That's what he's saying. In other words, God is first. And because God is first, whatever love and and dedication you have to your parents doesn't seem to be as appreciated as you would like it to be. Because you're, especially if you're from a, like a Zulu background, Kosa background, and you turn around to your parents and say, I'm a born-again believer now. I'm not going to do ancestors. They think you are hating our family and you are hating our ancestors. And it's not that case. It's the case that that person is saying, no, I love God, number one, and I love you, number two. That's the cost of following the Lord. It actually says to hate even your own life. We live in a world that's saying you've got to love yourself more. And God's saying got to hate your life. Why? Because he already knows you love your life. We love our lives. We love ourselves. Why why are you so upset that people don't like you? Because you love yourself. Isn't that right? Why are you upset that you're not as beautiful as the person down the road? Oh, I hate myself. Why are you so upset? Because you love yourself. You wish you were more beautiful. Because you think you should be that. We love ourselves. It comes naturally. What the Lord is saying is, love your neighbor 
just as you already do love yourself. If you're hungry, what do you do? Get something to eat. You don't starve yourself on purpose as if, like, I'm going to go three days without food. I hate myself so much. You, you get something to eat. If you're dirty and you feel dirty, I feel just dirty. You go and take a shower. You look after yourself. Some people are better than others. Women, I'd say, are better than guys, but that's a generalization. But we, we love ourselves already. Scripture's calling us to love God number one. The answer to not loving ourselves the most is not by doing as much as we can to make our lives as miserable as possible. The answer is to love God with everything. That when you come into conflict with God, you say no to yourself and you say yes to God. That's what Scripture's calling Israel to do and through Israel speaking to us. There's a problem Israel have, and the problem is in verse 29 of chapter 5. The law is good and it is perfect. And I've said this before, but it's worth saying it now because it's part of this passage. The problem is that Israel do not have the heart to follow the God. He says in verse 29, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments all the days that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. What is the main problem in Kokstad? We, we had it raised, like, about changing society, about... And I, and I don't decry anyone from attempting to build up communities, and I, I'm not into just saying don't try. But there's, a, there's something we need to understand. The main problem is not corruption in the sense of embezzlement of funds. It's not criminality. The problem is not primarily the fact that there's a lack of cohesion in the community. It's not racism. The main problem is the heart. That is problem number one. If you had a community full of godly hearts, Coxtet would be absolutely changed. And so do your projects. Do, like, do your community projects, and, but know that this is not the thing that's going to fix things in any eternal sense of the word whatsoever. The thing that will change things for eternity, that will have fruit that incrementally grows eternally, that has an eternal increase, is God changing the heart. Think of it this way, when you put a pebble into a pool of water, what do you get? Okay, do those ripples go on forever? They dissipate. That's basically the law of futility that we live with. No matter how, what good you do, it's just going to pit it out. Unless every generation and every person comes into a personal relationship with the Lord, it will not last. But that which the Lord does in me incrementally grows forever. There's an eternal inheritance. There's an eternal investment. There's an eternal increase. There's an internal um, what's the word? Interest on that investment that God does in your life. It goes on forever. Why? Because it goes on forever in the lives of people that are continually connected to the Lord. And so we go on from there to chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. In chapter, one, six, um, chapter 6, verses 1 to 9, you could summarize it this way. Live, eat, sleep, walk, dance, Drink the law. In other words, the law should be part of every aspect of your life, Israel. And so what does he call them to do? They're to write it on the doorposts of their houses. The word doorpost in Hebrew is mezuzah, plural mezuzot. You know, Jewish people, even today, they have a little box. They call it a mezuzah. It comes from this verse. And they put a little, part, a little scroll of the law in there and they literally obey this. They literally put it on the doorposts of their houses and on their gates. And when they walk in, they make, might touch it as they walk in as a reminder of the law of God. He says you to put it as frontlets between your eyes and on your hand. So what they do, and even the Lord himself, Jesus himself may have done this, 
they have a scroll of the law inside a box. We call it phylactery. They call it tefillin. And they will bind it around the head to be between their eyes, and they will literally bind it to their arm, and they will pray with that. It's to be a reminder. And in fact, if you go down to verse 7, or verses 6 and 7, it says, the, in chapter 6, these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. Now, how do they get the law on their heart? Verse 7 says, you shall teach them diligently to your sons. That word teach, you shall teach, is shinantem. And the word shinan, which it means to cut into, to inscribe. It's, uh, it's where the word tooth comes from, shen. So the word tooth in Hebrew, the letter shin, actually speaks of teeth. And the teeth cut into something. They bite into something. So you are to bite into your children the law. You are to inscribe. When you inscribe something, you leave a mark. So God wants his word to leave a mark on the lives of his people. And you do that by cutting in. Don't you, don't you, isn't it often said by, especially teenagers, ah, again, again, you're saying it again, yeah, I know. What are you doing when you, do, when you say that again and again and again? You're inscribing those principles into those children's lives. You're inscribing so that they won't forget, so that they learn. And so the, the, the God wants them to, when they walk in the way, to speak of the law. When they go down to bed to think on the law, to meditate. In fact, someone says to meditate on the law of the Lord day and night. You know that word meditate? It doesn't mean think. That's part of it. It means to mutter quietly. <laughs> to mutter quietly. If you are meditating, you are talking over the law to yourself. You're actually making sound. Not loud sounds, but you are making noises with your mouth as you, as you meditate. That's what the word means. It's the same word that speaks... Eke, to... to, to to meditate is the same word used of the, the, the mediums and the spiritists that mutter and peep. It's the same word, making a low sound. So the head, the mouth and the mind are working together. It includes thought. Meditation is not clearing your mind and just sitting there in a trance. That's not meditation. That's, that's Eastern meditation. Biblical meditation uses the mind because you meditate on the law, and the word for law means teaching. It's, you've got to use your mind, but meditation uses the mouth as well. Biblical meditation, that is. And so, God is calling them to inscribe it into the kids so that that word becomes part of every part of life as that child walks. At school, I had a good father who was always speaking about God's things with me. So at school, when I was learning my lessons, there'd be times that I would think of how this connected to something in the Bible. Because the law, God's law is for all of life. And so there's biblical principles that we apply. We just got to remember that God has to be at the center of it. And then we go on to ch chapter 6, verses 10 to 22, chapter 8, and chapter 9 to chapter 10, verse 11. Having embraced the law, having taken on board, having learned it, what happens next? You're tested. And there are two tests that Deuteronomy pulls out. The first, let's go to Deuteronomy 8, and verses 16 to 20. In the wilderness, God fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. He led you through the wilderness, where you didn't know where your water was coming from, and you didn't know where your um, food was coming from, and you had to cry out to the Lord, to provide. He led you through that to firstly humble you and secondly to test you. 
This is the test of adversity and difficulty. God leads us through difficult situations, and in those situations, he tests us. But there is another test as well. Verse 17 and 18. Lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember Yahweh your God, for it is he who has given you the power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. There is also the test of prosperity. I would say, when I look at New Zealand, New Zealand has failed the test of prosperity. In their prosperity, they've turned their back on God. And it happens. We are tested in poverty. We are tested in plenty. Both are a test. When God looks at two people, a millionaire and somebody who's struggling just to put food on the table, that doesn't come into his factoring of who's wealthy and who's not. God doesn't look at the wealth and the poverty of that person. He looks at their faith. The Bible says God's chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. God doesn't look down on you in terms of how much you have or how little of you have. And some people who are rich look down on poor people, not all. Some people who are poor look down on rich people. The real issue is not the wealth. The real issue is the heart. I knew a guy, and we call him Mkulu. His name was Daniel Kamala, but you don't call someone who is much older than you by their first name. You call them Baba or Mama Umkulu or Gogo. And when I met him, he wasn't saved. He accepted the gospel in his 60s. He said, how can I, how can I accept Jesus? How can I accept the, the gospel? I'm old. He's meaning I'm set in my ways. How do I do that? And I said, that's interesting because there's somebody else who was also old. His name was Nicodemus. And Jesus says, you need to be born again. He committed his life to the Lord. This guy grew all kinds of vegetables in his garden. One day I came and there were three pineapples planted there. And I was like, have you ever planted pineapples before? He said, no, I just wanted to try. He was busy. And when I look at, looked at him and I saw his work ethic and I saw how he was with people, he was very um, personable. I thought, if you were born in a different era, in a different culture, in a different time, you'd probably be managing within a company. But alas, he worked on a mine and he lived in a mud house, but he was rich. I actually, every time we had visitors, we'd bring them to his house and they'd see, like he, he worked hard. One of our friends who came, he just saw, and, and Mkulu didn't expect anything from anyone. He wasn't looking for handouts, but my friend was so touched by him. He went and got him boots and gloves and gardening implements just to bless the guy. And the guy was just so over, overjoyed at this gift that he wasn't expecting. He was poor in the eyes of the world, but he was so rich. And he was rich, not because of his, his hard work ethic. He was really rich because he ate the word of God and he applied it to such an extent. At his funeral, we were in New Zealand at the time. At his funeral, they told us, people were testifying, we saw the change in this man's life. In a community that lives around you and sees what you're doing, and you know small town communities, it's like you're always looking at what each other is doing. They testified to that in his life. That was the reality of the gospel. He was rich. And so there's the test of adversity. He passed it. Would we pass the test of prosperity? That's another question. Or are we quick to forget things because we take things for granted and we don't realize it is God. Because here's the thing, when you are making wealth or you're succeeding in a business or you're succeeding in something, it's easy to think, wow, we got there and we did it. Because why? You are playing yourself. You don't sit there in a corner and just pray and then bang, wow, successful business. You have to do your part. You have to apply yourself. And so when you apply yourself and you're successful and you're good at what you do, it's very easy to forget it is the work of the Lord through me. I'll give you an example, Nebuchadnezzar. 
Do you think Nebuchadnezzar was sitting around praying when the, that, uh, in the spread of his empire? He spread his empire. He created one of the eighth wonders of the world. Or I don't think it was Nebuchadnezzar, but in Babylon, they had one of the eight wonders of the world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Babylon was impressive. And he looked at the, 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 his kingdom, and he said, look what I've accomplished. And what did God do? Changed his head, mind. He acted like an animal for seven years. And when he woke up from that, he, he, he thought, God raised me up. Yes, I applied myself. But you've got someone like Daniel Mkulu, like Mkulu Daniel Kamalo, applied himself, never had a break. It happens for different reasons. Just the fact that everything has fallen into place, despite all the difficulties and trials and things that were against you, and you've persevered, there are certain things that come into place, certain customers that come to you and not to somebody else. There's certain, um, you get rain that another farmer doesn't get. They get hail and you don't. There's lots of factors that contribute to success. And it's that humility to remember it is the Lord and all glory to him. God is calling Israel to remember where you've come from. I think of Paul. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, I am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Now, in the modern world, especially in the psychological arena, some psychologists would look at that and say, see, Paul struggled with low self-worth because he can never get over his past. Paul wasn't struggling with his image. When he said that, it's a statement of fact. I'm not fit. I, am, I don't deserve to be called an apostle. Look what I did. It is fact. He wasn't struggling with himself. How do we know? Because he continues and says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And Paul didn't want to wield his authority heavily. He didn't go into a church and say, I'm the apostle, you listen to me. But sometimes he had to stand on his apostleship because the danger of infiltration by false teaching came into the church and he had to defend his apostleship, which he did not want to do. What am I saying? I'm saying that the way to defeat our high estimation of ourselves is to even have a higher estimation of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. It is God and God alone that has brought me this far. Not my cleverness, not my might, though God has used them. It is the God who is at work within me, who's brought me to this place. My victories are his victories through me. And I just had the privilege of cooperating with him. If it had not been from the, for, for the Lord, if it had not been for the Lord, where would I be today? It is him, the amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It is grace that's um, brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. What does grace mean? Unmerited favor. I do not deserve it. So it's a humility. The other thing that we see, and you'll see this, and I'll just make reference to it, in, num um, in chapter 9, verse 22, he raises the issue of Israel's rebellion, rebellion at Kadesh Barnea, at Massah, which he's already mentioned, that we looked at in Kibrot Hatta'ava. Well, Kadesh Barnea, they failed to go into the land when God called them to. They rebelled. And then in Massah, that's where they complained of water, and Moses struck the rock, and he was supposed to strike the rock at that time. And Kibrot Hata'ava is basically meaning the graves of the greedy people. Because when God gave them quail, they gorged themselves on the quail that God gave them. And um, so many of them died and they had to bury them in the graves of the greedy people. So what does this show? God is saying, guys, don't think too highly of yourselves. It's not because you are worthy or righteous that I'm bringing you into your land. In fact, the reason I'm getting you to deal with these tribes, it's not because of your righteousness, it's because of their wickedness. That's why. I think of um, a book called Pastors and Teachers by Derek Prime. And um, he had 
um, people talking bad about him. You know, when someone lies about you or says something that's true, but it's something in the past, and you get kind of upset by that. And people were talking about him. You know how he responded? He prayed audibly in front of everybody. And he said about this thing that this person is saying about me, Lord, I thank you. They don't even know the half of what you know. Because if they did, wow, they could really go to town. You know, so this is the thing. Remember where you came from. Remember what God saved you from. The godliness that people seeing you today was not there 20 years ago. It is the work of the Lord. And so that helps us to stay humble and obedient when things start to go better. We've got to remember, as Paul says in Romans 7 verse 18, in me that is in my flesh there dwells no good thing. At the wedding we went to yesterday, there was a Gogo who knew your, your dad. That's the one I was mentioning before. And um, she was, she lives in Pretoria. Get that, this is crazy. In the wedding, which is Masuli, who I started teaching the Bible when I was 10, there's another guy there called Kwasi, who's from Freya, who didn't know him at that time, but they're friends now in the same church. And we speak to the bride's grandmother who lives in Pretoria, the family is from Amtata, and she hears we're from Coxtech. She says, do you know Andrew McKenzie? <laughs> Isn't that Lord amazing how he just connects people? And this lady from Pretoria, this Gogo, she just said, she kept saying this, dependence on the Lord, dependence on the Lord, dependence on the Lord. That's what God is calling Israel to. And that's what he's calling you and me to. Yo, when you, when you conquer that sin in your life, and you get, you, you've done it, I've overcome. When you feel good about yourself, guess what? Bang, you fall into the same thing. Why? Because it was not you, it was the Lord through you. We should say, all glory to God and God, please keep me, I don't want to fall the next time. And then we go on to chapter 7. And this is the fourth section. This goes beyond the trial and the test that we need to pass. And when you pass the test, you don't pat yourself on the back because you haven't arrived. God's calling us to greater depths. And what he's calling to Israel is, uh, here is in chapter 7, radical obedience. The radical obedience, verses 1 to 4, in this context was radical warfare. God told Israel to go into the land and to annihilate Canaanite tribes. Men, women, and children. That doesn't sit well with us today in the West. But there's a reason God said it. And there's a lesson we can learn from it. And the lesson is in verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 4 says, the reason you to show no mercy is because if you don't, like in verse 3, furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You'll not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Why? For they will turn your sons away from following me and they will serve other gods. Now the reason why this isn't as severe as some people think, you know, obliterate, is because one, God made provision for subjugation of those tribes. God knew that not everyone was going to be wiped out. Secondly, there was mercy and grace for Canaanites if they attached themselves to Israel. One of the first examples of this was Rahab from Jericho. She said, I'll I will spy out for your tribe, uh, for your spies, and I'll look after them, and I will protect. But you remember me when you come into the land. And they swore by the Lord that if she hung that scarlet thread out of the window, her place would be spared, and everybody in her house. And when the walls of Jericho fell, and her house was in the walls of Jericho, guess what? Her house stood. There was grace for the Canaanites that turned from their wicked ways. She was a prostitute. 
probably a sacred prostitute, I'm guessing, following pagan gods, and who knows what she would have been involved in in her life. You read Deuteronomy 18, you read the sins people did, it's ancestors, it's occult, it's child sacrifice. But there was mercy for Rahab, and guess what? She became one of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah himself. The vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus pardon receives. God cleans everything. God changes everything. God's hands are open to the vilest sinner, and he's saying anybody is welcome, but it's his way. God doesn't accept us for who we are. Sometimes we want to hear that. God, ex- God loves me just the way I am. The truth is he loves you too much to keep you the way you are. God has more for you in your life than you just going to heaven. He wants to manifest the character of his son in you. He wants people, when they see you, to see something different and think, wow, there's something different about that person. He wants people to see you from your past, to look at you now and say, what's happened? You're not the same person. That's what the Lord wants. The Canaanite could find salvation, but it called for radical commitment. Like you turn your back on your people and you join the people of God. That's what God was calling them to. But what do we learn from this? The Canaanites were those that kept Israel from possessing the land. Their inheritance. Our inheritance is in the heavenly places. God has eternal rewards for us. And what are the Canaanites in our life? It's not the neighbor across the road that you say, God, strike them down. It actually says in Scripture, pray for your enemies. Bless those who curse you. What are our real Canaanites? It's our own sin nature. That's the big Canaanite in our life. That's what we've got to overcome. And it's calling for radical obliteration. I'm I'm preaching myself under conviction here. Because it's radical obliteration. Verse 5 says, This you shall do. You'll tear down their altars and shatter their sacred pillars and cut their asherim in pieces and burn the graven images with fire. Now we're under grace. We're not part of the nation of Israel. But what are we doing having that Buddha in the corner of the room? Yes, it looks beautiful, it's pretty. But God actually says in chapter 12, let's turn there because I think this is very pertinent. It's very pertinent because we live in a multi-faith society that says we should learn from each other. Chapter 12, verse 29. It will be when Yahweh your God brings you into the land where you're entering to possess it, that you shall set the blessing... Uh, I might, no, I'm going the wrong chapter. Chapter 12, verse 29. I was reading chapter 11. When Yahweh your God cuts off before you the nations which you're going into dispossessing, you dispossess them and inhabit their land. Beware, lest you be ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed before you, unless you inquire after their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods that I may do likewise? That's not saying necessarily, oh, can I worship their God? It's saying, how do they worship their God that I can learn to worship like they are? Even worshiping God according to the pagan way is abominable to God. So why am I turning to Hinduism to improve my life with yoga? Why am there was a church in the cathedral in Manchester, it's Anglican. Anglican Cathedral in Manchester, England, had a spirituality fate festival, and I've forgotten how many years it was. I remember my parents sent me information that we were living in Freyheid at the time. I think it was then. And um, they had Shaman, they had fortune tellers, they had crystals, all of these things that are how the pagans worship or do their spirituality. And we're to bring it into the house of God 
and we can learn from other religions? God is saying, don't learn from the pagans how to worship. Don't learn from the pagans how to do spirituality. Get it from the law, the teaching of God. That's what he was calling them to do. And so he actually calls them back in chapter um, 7, verses 5 to 6, and I've just read it, you to shatter and break down and destroy the images. I remember my dad, we were in um, a church in Eccles, Manchester, with um, the pastor, he came to South Africa, Dave Royal. He was pastoring, and my dad did a teaching in that message about how the God of Catholicism and the Jesus of Catholicism cannot save. And he took a statue of Mary, I think he made it himself, and he took a hammer and he smashed it, like physically smashed it. And he took the picture, the, 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 the Catholic, um, they have these pictures of saints, and he cut it up. And there was a couple there that were from a Catholic background and they didn't follow Catholicism, but it emotionally affected them. Because in Catholicism, if you grow up in it, it's deeply entrenched in you. But this is what we call idoniclasm, where you destroy the idols. And my dad did that physically, and I think we should do it physically. If we've got stuff in our house that is of our pagan past, I'm not talking about a picture that's from someplace in Africa that was just done for tourism. I'm talking about the real McCoy, the real thing. Like, and, and especially if you were involved in it, I don't think you should have it in your house. I'm not saying you, you're cursed by it, but I'm saying if there is a hook in your life that can get you to compromise your walk with the Lord, because the hook is not in the picture, the hook is in me. That's why we get it out of the house. Because God calls Israel to destroy the idols of the pagans. Lastly, God calls Israel in chapter 10, verse 12, to chapter 11, verse 32, to circumcise their own hearts. A circumcised heart is necessary for us to obey God. And with, the, with Israel, because they're under the law, if they keep the law, there's blessings, but if they disobey the law, there's curses because they would be under the curse of the law. Now, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And I find it very amusing, not amusing, because that's the wrong word, but it just like baffles me how someone takes Malachi chapter, I think it's chapter 3, bring the whole tithe into my house, that there may be food in my house. And they say, if you don't bring the tithe into the church, you're under a curse. Well, firstly, let's put the record straight. What was the tithe? It was food. And I have, someone asked me just a few days ago, what do you think of tithing? And I said, I've never seen one church where anybody tithes. I've never seen it. Because if you were really tithing, you'd take 10% of your pumpkins and you bring 10% to church. You'd take 10% of your sheep. If you were really tithing, that's what you'd do. We'd have a, a room full, of, in the future, we'd have a room full of lambs coming in. And then Jack will be very <laughs> nervous about what's happening in this place. So we don't do that. But no one tithes. Because tithe was never of money. You say, ah, but no, but they, they tithe food because they didn't have money in those days. Yes, they did. But didn't they give of their gold and their silver to the construction of the tabernacle? Time of Jesus, they had a two drachma temple tax that was distinct and separate to the tithe. The tithe was always of food. What did he say? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and test me in this. But they will say, oh, you're not tithing, you're under a curse. That's the curse of the law. And God has redeemed us from the curse of the law. When God deals with us, it's not curse, it's discipline. It's discipline. It's not curse. Why is God 
calling them to do this. And why is he requiring their obedience? Because they are his representatives in Israel and in the land and among the nations. They are chosen of God, not because of how great they are, but because of the forefathers. And therefore, that's why there's the requirement that they live in the way that God calls them to live. And central to that in chapter 10, verse 16, God calls them, circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. God calls on Israel to circumcise their own hearts. In the future, he's going to remedy their problem by himself circumcising their hearts. They are to cut away the flesh. The flesh around the heart is meaning that insensitivity to the Word of God. If you have got diabetes, and I think it's type 1 diabetes, you need insulin, right? I think it's type 1, am I right there? And so you would, where do, where do you put that needle? Now, if you put that needle into your hand, would it feel different? Why does it feel different? Okay, so the fat is good, you'll still feel it, but you don't have the sensitivity that you have in other places in your body, right? So if you've got a heart covered with fat, it means you're insensitive to the voice of God. You're insensitive to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And God is calling for a sensitive heart. And so he's saying, you guys, you must do it. That's what the law required of Israel. The law is you do it yourself. Here's the instructions. Here's the teaching. This is my character. This is my nature. Now you take it and you go. Impossible. Impossible. There's four things that we need to look at in this section that speak of the way we should consider the Lord. Verse 20 says, Him you shall fear. Him you shall fear. Secondly, it says, cling to Him. And that word cling is like in a marriage. You cleave no matter what. You cleave. Thirdly, by His name you shall swear. So in other words, when you make your vows, you make them in the name of the Lord. Now, the, the, the Pharisees were very clever. What they did is they started to swear in the name of the temple. And so if you don't keep it, ah, I didn't swear by the gold in the temple, that's what counts, so I can get out of it. If you swear by God's name, you better keep it. You better keep it. And then verse 21 says, He is your praise, He is your God. What's that to do with? That's all to do with my attitude towards God. How I see God. How I regard God. I cannot do that externally. Circumcise your own hearts. They never did. Very few people ever did. The generations come and go and it just deteriorates. The ripples that were there initially just fade away. We need a fresh a fresh challenge, fresh conviction of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to say fresh touch because, you know, people will be thinking, oh, we need a fresh touch. Let's come to the front and put, my hand, put your hands on me. It's not that. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to me afresh and me responding to him. We need that. Each one of us. We need the Lord to infuse us and to empower us. If you look at verse 22... It say, he says to Israel, you are like the stars in number. You are like the stars in number. Verse 22, and I think that's possibly chapter 10. 10 verse 20. Is that right? Yes, it's right at the end of there. Verse 22. God's make you numerous like the stars in heaven. That's a very, very important phrase. In Genesis 15, verse 6, God promises Abraham, your descendants will be like the stars. But he doesn't say in number. He says, count the stars if you're able to count them. He says, so shall your descendants be. Now, on the surface, that means they're going to be numerous like the stars. But when are Abraham's descendants going to be like the stars? 
Daniel 12, verses 1 to 3, you can write it down. In the resurrection, they will be like the brightness of the brightness of the expanse and like the stars. They are like the sand of the seashore and the stars of the heaven. The sand of the seashore is their earthly side of their identity. They are physically descendants of Israel or part of that physical group. But there's a spiritual people who are going to be like the stars in heaven. I've got a teaching on this. If you want me to pass it to you, I'll pass it to you so you can check me out. It, it lays it out. But the stars speak of our heavenly calling. And it's interesting, he specifies you are like the stars in number. You can outwardly look like the stars. You can be like the stars. You can fulfill it physically. But we need to f- be f- have that fulfilled internally. Because when you're like the stars, you're going to be like angels in heaven. You're going to have a new body. Those aches and pains that you're experiencing won't experience them anymore. But more fundamental than that is you will have the character of Jesus. And you will rule and reign with Jesus. Even judging angels. In 1 Corinthians it says we will judge angels. But to do that and have that responsibility, there needs to be that internal change in ourselves. And that's why we'll never experience them that until we get our new bodies. The Lord would not entrust us with that any more than you would entrust Joel with a chainsaw. You would not do it. It's too dangerous. When you get a bit older, it would be good. We need to get older. You and I, we need to become like Jesus. We need to grow up into maturity so that the Lord may entrust responsibilities with us. And we only do that by growing up and overcoming the test and taking his word to heart. And ultimately, we will only get that level of responsibility when we become just like Jesus. This is our training ground for the promised land. We're not here just to preach the gospel and see people saved. That's what evangelists, that's what they're about. They're about people getting saved and going to heaven. But God wants that, but that's not it. That's not all of it. Part of it is growing a people into maturity to train them for the kingdom to come so that when we stand at that beamer seat of Christ, he will apportion our inheritance according to our faithfulness in the here and now. So be encouraged. Everything that you do in life is an act of worship for the Lord and in your faithfulness to glorify him in whatever you are doing, you are, the Lord is using that to train you for the kingdom, 